Welcome, church family, to Moments with Pastor David and Marie. Uh, we're so excited to be here with you guys and excited that we're back in church. And so I want to say welcome to Pastor and Marie. Thank How you, How are you guys John. doing? We're good. Good. It's good to be back Wasn't in church. Wasn't it great to be back? It is. It is. Such a blessing to see our, our church family on Sunday. I didn't know what to expect Sunday, but that worship was great. And then the teaching, you know, the teaching was on point. And that, that's something I, well, let me ask you this before we jump into that. So tell me, tell the church or explain to the church, how does it feel for you, both you guys to be back? Well, we were, we were not able to have church services for 10 weeks. And um, that's the longest that I've, I've gone that I can remember that I haven't had a Bible study. Um, even prior to becoming a pastor here or or an assistant pastor in the other church I used to serve in. I began teaching in around September of 1973. And from that point all the way to where we're at now, the longest I ever took off was three months. And that was when I was, I was in Europe for three months. And <coughs> excuse me. So for me as a uh, pastor teacher, especially pastor in this church, it was difficult. It was difficult to be gone for 10 weeks. I was concerned for our church. Not that they aren't grounded in the word because a good portion are, but because it, you know, the scripture says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And so, you know, because we are a one another entity, the church, I was concerned because we need each other. And so it was difficult. And Marie and I were able to... Um, and get to the point where we simply just knew that the Lord, by His Spirit, is going to lead us. We're going to regather. We'll assemble once again. And and um, that's what happened this last Sunday. And a good portion of the church is still not with us. But I do know, just by keeping tabs on them through various means, that that many of them are with us online. And um, as they're getting the word. And when they have a, a sense of peace and ability... Prayerfully, they'll be once again with us uh, in live services. And so from that perspective, I'm very, uh, very happy to be back. Very happy. I remember the times when this whole quarantine first started. We, You would come on Sundays. You and Marie would come on Sundays. And it would just be a couple of guys out there. I think there was yourself, myself, Victor. I think Derek was there. Just a couple of guys. And I remember thinking, wow, what's, what's it going to look like when we come back? It just seemed such a long time ago. And now that we're in, in the process of opening and have, have opened the services, it was just great to be with church family. It is. And it was just the, the worship together was amazing. And, you know, Pastor, something I was discussing with Livy, uh, for those who don't know, Livy's my wife. Uh, you know, your teachings have been on point. I mean, you've been like, my wife would say, Pastor's on fire today. What's changed? I think the sense of what is taking place in our society um, has given me a, a greater urgency. I also believe that based on the fact that I could not see who I was speaking to, I couldn't interrelate with them in a conversational way, which eliminated stories and illustrations and humor. And it just went down, just kind of boiled down to the essentials of what I wanted to teach and the exhortation that is my um, primary gift. So that's why it would se you would sense that it was a little more direct and um, on point in that way. Uh, now that we're back together again, I, I don't want to lose that because I really feel that that was something very valuable. Um, the church benefited from that and um, my humor sometimes can get the best of me because I like to tease with my church. That's my personality. But I have to be careful that I remain uh, focused. And especially right now in the conditions that we find ourselves in in our nation. You know, I think it's a sober, sober time. And I have to try and re remain more sober-minded as I teach and and uh, bring the word in such a way that is encouraging and instructive. And I would say that that's uh, part of what it was. Yeah, this last Sunday you were speaking. Actually, it was last night, Wednesday night, uh, as you see that this will be, for those who are there Wednesday night, we were speaking about, uh, you know, the, 
taken to, for granted our, our relationship with Christ at times, even as we're growing up in the church. So that really spoke to me, kind of to a point where I had to examine my heart even now. So what are some of those things that I, I take for granted? And so just uh, that point was just like, wow, that really spoke to me. And uh, we kind of got, the staff kind of got spoiled though, because we were able to be, well, we're still able to come, but we were there for you, with you during that time where we were just, when you're recording on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, and it's almost like we have Pastor David to ourselves and, and we would be, you know, we would go there, but it's good to be back and to be able to be with the church. Uh, and so, well, you know, you guys, I wanted to speak a little bit on ministry and marriage. And uh, we had a conversation not too long ago where we were talking about the dangers that can come about when somebody has this desire to serve who are married and maybe have young children or who are married and have older children, this desire to have such a want a strong desire to serve that it really takes away from marriage, family, and children. And I would like to see what would you both tell that person, the one that's so excited to serve, wants to be at church all the time, and who is married and have young children? Well, there's a lot that, that I could share about that. Um, obviously, because Marie and I went through that ourselves, you know, and so I like zeal. I like the idea that somebody has a desire to serve God with all of their heart. And uh, even as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, he made it clear, he said that those who are married should be as if they are not, for the time is short. So there needs to be a sense of the desperation of the hour, and people need to have heavenly priorities, kingdom priorities, and, and all of that. But seeing that you are married, he also went on to say that someone who's married has a lot of concerns, you know, because you do. You're concerned for how you may please your wife. You're concerned for how you are raising your children. And you're concerned for things that are domestic. And so to juggle those things, to find a place where you're able to do both, you know, serving God in your fellowship and serving your family, to do both well, and that's a difficult, that's a difficult um, task because you want to do things by putting your hand to the plow, going straight, doing it with all of your might, and doing it well. At the same time, there are demands your family has that, you know, things that you will never duplicate. You'll never be able to be there for your child's first birthday again or second birthday again. You know, it comes one time in a lifetime, right? And that's where the juggling comes in. Where Where should I be at this time? I have something to do at church, but I also have something to do with my family. So that's a very difficult thing. So for me as a pastor, um, and you, you know this, I have an inclination towards wanting my, my staff to be fully committed to the task at hand. And I would like them to trust me enough to know that I want to help to protect their family. So I will not necessarily ask you or somebody else to do something if it's going to infringe on your time with your child or your wife. And the only time I want to encourage you to do certain things will be during uh, regular church hours or whatever. But the things that come after that, you know, oh, I'm going to go do a breakfast or we have a conference or I'm going to travel to another place for a while. Those are things I'm very restrictive of with my staff now because I don't want to take you or them from their families, you know, and so for Marie and me, we made our choices, you know, and I I did my best to be there for my kids as, as much as I could in their lifetime. I don't think any of them would complain that I wasn't there enough for them, but there were times when I wish I would have been there, you know, times when David played in a football game and I wasn't able to be there to watch him. The first time he actually was able to suit up and get in a game, I'd gone to every game and this one game, because he hadn't played, he was just a young guy that weren't playing him. The, the first game that he ever played in, I wasn't there because I took Marie for a weekend to San Luis Obispo. And he called me up and he was only 14 and he cried on the phone. And he said, Dad, I played and you weren't there. See, so I tried to be there for everything I could, but 
I wasn't always able to be there. So I, I'm aware of that. And so I try to be careful with, with my staff, with you and others who have younger children. Like, you know, I've said this to you, your baby's going to be your baby for just so long. And then one day, well, the little girl's going to walk in and she's going to say, Daddy, I met the guy that I really like. Or the little boy's going to walk in and say, Daddy, I met the guy, I mean, I met the girl that I really like. He won't say the guy. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but I found the one that I care about. You know, that's going to happen. And um, I don't want to take from you or any of the other staff those moments. But sometimes they are voluntarily given up because you see uh, the greater need. And that's what I see. I see sometimes now, even more so now than before, the greater need. And the greater need very often is making sure that the gospel goes out, that people are cared for, and um, that, we're, that we're honorable before the Lord. So it's a matter of learning to juggle priorities. Sometimes your family comes first. Uh, always God is first, but sometimes your family comes before the church needs. And that's where I think good training and trusting comes in as a pastor. I try to train my, my staff, my key staff personnel, to be able to carry the load, to share it, so that I can say I'm gonna be in Israel for two weeks and I don't have any concern that this church is operating properly, because it is. you know, Or I'm gonna be gone on a Sunday because I'll be over here or over there. And I'm not concerned that things will fall apart, you know, because they don't. The church belongs to Christ. But I have responsibility to develop organization, to make things go as smoothly as possible. That's an administrative thing that I'm supposed to do. And I'm very careful with those things, as you know, because I believe that um, the larger the church, the more things can go wrong. And so you have to be aware of all of those things. And that's where my training of you guys has come in over, over time to, to impart to you that which was imparted to me so that you're able to carry that load. If I'm not here, the other guys are able to do that. And, and that's how it works. Marie does the same kind of thing with her women's ministry. And long ago, I, I, I remember serving while he was teaching. And I would be and with the babies, you know, or the children, any children that would come to the study. And, um, you know, it was great training. It's great training. And it's great training for us women to get involved in, 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 uh, in helping out in the church. It's a bless it was a blessing. It was a blessing. And um, Dave and I even ministered together, too, in the children's uh, ministry yeah, we as did. well. Yeah, we, we as well, care. you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and this was before our church. You know, part of it was you know, before we began our church because, you know, how are we going to rise up and, and know what these children need or, or the ministry is in need of if we're not being in there and getting our hands in there, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, um, being with these children and, and, and uh, loving them and, and encouraging in them in the things of the Lord. So that, that was important. And also another thing that, that I, I felt that uh, um, we also would um, have young people over they were in they were high schoolers or at the end of high school mm -hmm. and um and uh it took a lot of ministry but it was uh, it was very fruitful i feel it we, we had a very fruitful time of ministering to these young young people who had come to the church and uh, dave gave them studies and we spent time with them and um, we saw them have their baby get married and have babies and and uh, and uh, it was it was a, a it truly was a, a joy for us to be involved with them. And on the other side of that, when you serve together, there's almost this embedded safeguard in the marriage because you're serving alongside with one another, serving the Lord, and there can be this. Uh, as we mentioned last week, we're talking about communication. If you're in the Word together or in praying together, and Pastor mentioned serving together, then the there's fruit in the marriage, and so that's that's also a benefit of serving together. You know what happened, John, is um, when our church began, and it started growing. I started um, s seeing the 
the need and sometimes receiving opportunities to to step out of the four walls of our church to go to some other place and to minister or to learn and um and i began to pray and i i marie and i we had our our small children they were small and i began to pray because i i felt that that uh, the horizons were a lot larger than just the the four walls of the church i needed to step out and do something and i was given the opportunity an invitation to go to china to smuggle bibles wow and so um i told marie that i said you know i've been given the opportunity to go to china and she said oh and i knew she was mm -hmm. you know resistant to the idea because it's an offense that you can be arrested for at that time probably still is and uh you know and then we had small babies i forget if we had three was, or we had yeah. we had three Anna, babies at the Anna time was, was born. Anna born how old were they pastor born. well on it on a would on a this would have been 35 years ago so about 35 years ago so they were all small my daughter corinne would have been around seven and my youngest would have been a year or two you know right in there they were they were small and so um you know so i had to think about that and so I told her, but you know, I'm I'm thinking perhaps the Lord is saying to do this, and I, it wasn't like I was real anxious to do so. Oh, I have to. You know, it was more like a sense that I should do this. And Marie went to a, a pastor's wives conference, and she came home, and Sandy McIntosh had shared in one of her one of the sessions, and she said, "Whatever God calls your husband to, you need to support that." And Marie came home, I still remember the conversation where she walked in and I said, how was your conference? And she began to share and she said, the Lord spoke to me through Sandy mm -hmm. and I am to set you free to go and do what he called you to do. Because I was hesitant. She didn't want me to go. And, I, and I'm one of these husbands that I, I want to hear the Lord's voice, not just in my own heart. I want it, I want it seconded by my wife because she's part of my ministry. And, and if, if God's not speaking to her, then I will wait until he does. I don't just go out and tell her, he told me to do this and you're gonna follow. I don't do that. Mm -hmm. I will say to her, and I've been doing it for many years, I'll say, this is what the Spirit seems to be telling me, baby. And so I want you to take it before the Lord. And, and she has peace, then we can work together. Because if, if your wife doesn't have peace and, and a sense of calling to that, there's a good chance she's going to disrupt that. It's going to be a problem. There won't be any fruit. She's going to resist it. And I, I don't want that in my marriage or in my ministry. And so I told her, I said, the Holy Spirit seems to be uh, provoking me to go. And she came home and she said, um, the Lord said, whatever God tells you to do, you're to do. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how I began to actually step out of the four walls and I went to China, and then we went to the Philippines and in India, and just different missions and different opportunities began to open up. But it began with prayer, and it began with the Spirit speaking to me and the Spirit speaking to her. And united, we were both willing to pay whatever price was going to be exacted for doing what God said. I didn't want to go somewhere and and get arrested or get in some kind of problem or or lose my life for that matter and have her live the rest of her life thinking i should have told them what i was feeling i didn't want that and the best way for me to prevent that was to tell her you need to take it before the lord and and for me to just wait on the spirit of god because bibles can come to china at different times i don't have to go right now i'd have right. to go with this I'll go when God says. And so she came home. It just so happened God's timing. She came home from that from that uh, pastor's wives conference and she said, God told me to let you go wherever you're supposed to go and not to hold back. Let me tell you what had happened while he was gone. Well, we had a little bit of an accident. My little daughter, the baby, decided to jump, jump off the couch and I couldn't get to her in time. And so we had some broken arms, you know, a broken arm. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was me on my own. But God was, God had sustained me. David's parents had come over. I remember they came over mm -hmm. well, I watched the rest of the uh, children. Well, I went to, um, um, 
Well, I went to the doctor's office, and uh, and she she was admitted into the hospital, wow. and she uh, uh, they they put uh, what did they was put? Was it a bar or something? They in put there? they put well they put uh, I can't remember exactly, but um, she was in traction. That was my baby. They put her in traction. That was my baby, and. Um, well, actually, that was a different time. She broke her arm three times. Two. Three times and dislocated it Oh, once. dislocated. Two different arms were broken. <laughs> anyway. Same arm? Different Just arms? Two different <laughs> Both arms have jump. been broken. She was a jumper. She <laughs> was a jumper. She, she jumped. She was a jumper. But, yeah. Okay, but yes. But she broke her arm. The second the reason I remember that, Mama, is because I was teaching a Wednesday night Bible <laughs> okay. study. Yes, that's I was true. teaching a Wednesday. That's right. And Marie called me to let me know. I'm at the hospital because right. Anna broke her arm again. So, yeah. And so I had to leave the Wednesday night That's Bible right. study yeah. to drive to the hospital. Yes. That and was the baby was in traction with Marie, and Marie is laying on the bed with her. She was a nursing baby. You know, she's still, she was only a couple of years old. And I came in, and Marie was, was, was nursing her baby, just snuggled up to her in this little baby bed. Very touching moment for me. And then I had to walk out and I heard her crying, daddy, daddy, daddy. And I'm standing, sitting in another room, listening to my baby crying in the other room as a setting her arm, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, you, you, we, we've gone through some things that, that, that have been difficult to do the things we're called to do. Yeah. We've, we've experienced quite a number of things, including those kinds of things. When you had gone to China, was it difficult for you to leave? Yes, I, I was taking the an elevator, an escalator. We were going up, and Marie was. You remember that? Mom? I do. Marie was was standing on the ground floor, and the escalator. I climbed in the escalator, and I kept watching her, mm -hmm. watching her eye, and she just watched me. She looked like I had died. She she had that look like something terrible, and I I, I just kept looking, even bending down when, when I couldn't see her anymore. And that was the last thing I saw was just her sitting with, con standing with concern. So it was very hard. It was very hard to go in and, and then to go into Beijing and to bring in uh, suitcases and Bibles and, and to know that we had to go through their customs and to know the potential to be arrested was, was very high and, and, uh, and all of that. Yeah. And the idea that I mean, even an incarceration of a short period of time, you know, is something that that was a concern. So yeah, it was very difficult for me and and uh, and for my girl here, you know, because she had small babies and and there's there are prices that you pay sometimes that that have such an emotional um, depth to them that you can't really tell other people what that felt like. Because a lot of people say, well, why'd you go? You don't have to go. See, they have a burden. They have <laughs> right. a sense. They don't, that's not their life. Why would they care? You know, but when we dropped off those, those Bibles, John, and we, we, met some, we met some people there, some Japanese people who were there. We met them, and they were transporting the Bibles to those who didn't have Bibles because there were whole churches with hundreds of people with no Bibles, hundreds of hundreds of members of the congregation. There were no Bibles. So we brought the Bibles into them. And I still remember putting my suitcase down, and I, don't, I won't go into the detail of how it happens that you transfer the Bibles, but there is a transferring that takes place. And when we put the, the suitcases down with all these Bibles in them, and I saw the Japanese people come, they were crying. They were crying as they were picking mm -hmm. up the Bibles. And how could I not let him go? How can I not, for the grace, you know, for, for the Lord's sake, that these people would find him and desire that? I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't, I, he had to go. He wow. had to go. I thank God because it was very freeing for me. Freeing, it freed me up. Because I want the Lord to use my husband in any way, in any, in all, always. Constant, constant, and in a constant way. I don't ever want to be the wife that held him back. Mm -hmm. And she has told me that many times, John, and she has been faithful to that. She let me go to India. She's, she's, she's blessed me as I've gone twice. You know, she's, she's never stood in my way. I've been to the Philippines several times to minister. 
leaving her behind with children, small children, you know, and, uh, you know, when God spoke to her heart and said, you let him be what he's called to be. And while that's what began to work in me, for me to say, I've, I've done what I'm supposed to be doing. I want to now take care of my wife and my children in a different way. And I actually stopped um, doing the kinds of things that opportunities were being afforded me to do. I began to say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to concentrate on caring for my family, especially as my children grew older and went through their their tumultuous teens and all. I didn't want to leave Marie with the responsibility of caring for children uh, that really required two parents for the teen years, especially. And so I, that's when I started backing off of doing the, um, the traveling that I was doing and the things that I was doing. That's when I began to back off and, and that just proceeded throughout the rest of our ministry. But Marie and I have a strong uh, sense that our real call has always been to this church. It's always been to this church. Mm -hmm. And so we've had plenty of opportunity to go worldwide, you know, to, to serve in other places, South America, Europe, you know, Asia. We've had chances to go, and we have, okay. and we still do, but not as frequently as we used to. It's cool to see that uh, even in the midst of even here in you, Marie, because I, I do know a, quite a number of people that who are couples, maybe the husband has a desire to serve or, or be in ministry and the wife or vice versa. And, and one, one or the other will not have that, that capability to release. And I know one of the things that you've mentioned before, Pastor Nart, and some of the guys that you're mentoring, is if, if there's a wife that does not release, it's, would you call that a disqualification? Or? He has no ministry. His real ministry is to his wife. And I believe that a man's uh, um, testimony of his ministry is his, is his wife, especially his wife. Because his children can go up and down, you know. And, and, and I, know, I know the qualifications that are outlined in Titus and, and in First, uh, First Timothy. I know those qualifications. But at a certain point, uh, a man's children come to that place where they're responsible for their own lives. But in marriage... That man and that woman are together until one of them goes to, to heaven. And so I have a, you know, of course, if some guy's got some crazy kids, you know, that disqualifies him. Why, why are you looking at me? Well, because I'm just <laughs> prophesying <laughs> what's going to happen. You see, your, your babies are small right now, but I'll, I'll be watching. Um, the one who really disqualifies you is Liv. <laughs> <laughs> Hear that, honey? <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, I, I, I'm real aware of that, but I'm, I'm, I'm much more aware of how the husband and the wife relate. You know, I, I say this, and it sounds sometimes, it's, it may not sound as um, genteel as it should, but I've said this before, even a dog that is neglected, you can tell, you know, how much more so a wife you know, I can tell when someone doesn't take care of their animals. But you can also tell when a woman is not cared for. You can tell. Mm -hmm. a, a woman who is loved by her husband and they have a good relationship, there's a sense that you will have with them. And it's not something they're contriving, because some do. Some put on like, oh, I love this. He's such a hunk and this and that, right? Now, that's, you can see through that pretty, pretty quickly. But it's the, it's the normal things that they do. It's just the way they are with one another, you know. Uh, I, I can see that any man who's been around as long as I have gains experience. And so I can see that. I can see that this is a woman that's cherished by this guy. And it's not what he's saying when she's there. It's what he says when he doesn't know I'm noticing and, and, and I do notice because I'm, if I'm in the same room and you've seen this about me, I'm observant. I notice things, you know, and I'll go, hmm, that was, hmm, and I'll say that to myself. I wonder what's going on with them. And you pick that up. And so a man's ministry is his wife. You know, the, the woman, Paul said, is the glory of the man. And, and your real ministry, a man's real ministry, is the wife. And, and I can see whether she's cherished, nourished, whether she's, she's taught, you know, I can see that. And, you know, what kind of spirit does she have? Does she have a, a kind, um, 
loving, gentle? What kind of spirit does this woman have? Because if that man is a man of God, then he's going to have certain qualities that the wife will begin to adjust to. And he's going to have an influence over her. And um, she may at one time be a little, little bit headstrong or whatever, you know, and there's nothing wrong with strength. I appreciate and love it. Sarah was a very strong woman in the Old Testament, but her name was originally Sarai. And Sarai means dominator, you know, and we can see what she did, you know, and go into my handmaiden, you know, and all of that. So she was a strong woman, but she became Sarah, and the name Sarah means princess. And so what happened? Well, the scripture speaks concerning the relationship, but one of the things about her that I find interesting is that she called him Lord, and she obeyed him. So there was some connection that they had that over time Abraham became that man, that father of many nations. He became that man of God that this woman eventually grew to you know, as strong as she was, she grew to respect to the point where she referred to him as the one who was master in her life. You know, and that, you know, I, I can almost hear some women right now, I ain't never going to call you I'm that, you know. <laughs> but you know what? She wasn't a weak woman. She was a strong woman. And I take, I think a strong woman needs a strong foil, if you will, a strong man, somebody who, who she can work with and grow with and and all, you know, my wife is a very quiet woman. As you've know, you've known her, you met her when you were six. You've known, <laughs> you know, you've known of Marie and known Marie for a while now. She's not a weak woman. She's a very, very sweet woman, you know, but she's not a weak woman. And that strength that she has is is not a an obnoxious. I have to be honest with that word. An a, a arrogant, pushy. It's not that kind of strength. It's a moral strength. She's a good woman. She's a good woman. And you see, and that's that's real strength. It's not that she, you do this and you shouldn't do that. And I won't, and she's not that woman. I just know that if this does not please her, it's because it's not a good thing. And I know that about her. And so because she's a good person, she influences me for good. It's because if she she knows this, if she told me you can't do that like that, <laughs> yeah, well, right. It <laughs> ain't gonna happen. No, you know? no, I'm an average man, you know. I'm not an unusual man. I just you're not gonna tell me what I'm gonna do. Not like that. I and she knows this. When we got married, she was trying to learn how to show me her concern, so she would speak in a certain way. And we were just married, and I'd say, I already have a mother. I have a mother. I don't need a second one. What I did is I married a woman who's my wife. So we need to learn to communicate so that I don't feel dominated by you or pushed around by you. That's not going to happen. And that's how she and I were. So she learned how to communicate to me. She learned how to say what was on her heart in a way that I understood. And I went about trying to figure out her language so I'd know what she was doing. And that's kind of how it worked with us. And so the thing that, that really is the influence that she has, because they say that the you know, they say the man is the head and the woman's the neck. You know, the man has authority, but the wife has influence. Mm -hmm. And my wife's influence is for good. And because I know that she loves Christ and she does her devotions. And she, she just today, she's sharing with me little tidbits from the devotions. And we were conversing over that. I see she has a private time with God. I respect that. And because she does... She's got influence in my life because I don't take, you know, well, the scripture says that I'm not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. I'm not going to take advice from somebody who's not pray prayerful and not thoroughly biblical. Why would I do that? That's not good advice. I'll be careful to listen to those who fear the Lord. My wife does. And so that's how our relationship works. And that's why I can say to her, which I do, I do it all the time. I'll say, you know, baby, um, we've been invited to go. We were talking about this yesterday. Honey, we've been invited to go. I've been invited to go to Utah to do uh, something in St. George, you know, and, uh, and in July. So I, I say, what do you think? You know, I could, I could say, yes, I'm going to go. Oh, oh, by the way, honey, we're going to go. I could do that, but I don't. I say to her, honey, I've been invited to. This is what they want of us. This is what it'll require for us. Um, what do you think? And I leave it in her hands. 
And she'll come back and she'll say, you know, whatever the Spirit's telling you. Well, honey, we're, I'm, I'm going to be doing a, um, a uh, pastor's leaders conference in uh, the state of Washington. And it's at this time. Um, what do you think? Just that was our conversation yesterday. Oh, well, I think that would be great. Yeah, honey, you can meet with the pastor's wives, the pastor's wife and you together can't, and we discuss these things. But it's always before, I always put them before her, these things before her. I don't come home saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Because that word we're means something. It's not, I'm going to do this, it's we're going to do this. And if I've got a hesitant, resisting wife, quenches the Holy Spirit and the work isn't done properly. So I want her in prayer, and she wants a man of prayer, and together we can work, and that's how it works. When you were mentioning that if, there, if the wife, let's say Marie does come back to you and say, honey, I don't know if that's a good idea, or the Spirit does speak through our wives yes. uh, and brings testimony or confirmation, how would you respond to something like that? I respond now differently than I did in the beginning. Now, I've always, always had a trust for Marie, but there's only been a couple of times, you'll remember this very quickly, that she's walked up to me and there was somebody that we had on staff. And she says, I don't trust that person. Was it me? <laughs> That's why I said we had on staff. <laughs> this is your last day. <laughs> My last interview. <laughs> uh, no, of course it wasn't. It was a number of years ago. She's done this twice. And both times she was 100% accurate. Both times, you know. To the pure, all things are pure. And and I've learned, I've learned. And, and, and there I was saying, well, baby, you just don't know them. You know, if you got to know them, you know, and some people, well, they're this, 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 and that. And I said, well, that's because you just don't know them. I think they're kind of rough around the edges. That was what I was saying. And she's just looking at me. And lo and behold, she was 100% right. So that that's that's happened a couple times. And so I am much quicker now to listen. If my wife says to me something, I listen. I really do because she can see what I don't see. And she walks in the spirit and she loves me in this church. And so if she has a sense in her heart, and this is not, she has a check of the spirit, I listen to her. And, and there are others like that that I listen to. But in our marriage, I most definitely, and that's why I'll present to her and I'll say, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Because I really do want to hear what she's thinking. She may see something I don't see. She may know something that I don't know. And so I need her. I need her advice. I need her, her wisdom, her experience. She's been in ministry pretty much as long as I have, almost as long as I have. So she knows what she's doing. The wisdom. She's got a lot of wisdom, she, but it's her purity. I have to be honest with you. It's, it's the purity of her heart, you know, and, and, and that's a fact. You know, anybody who knows Marie knows that about her. It's, it, it's a fact. She's got a gentle, loving, caring spirit. She doesn't admit to it as much as it's really there. But that's what, one of the qualities about her that I love, too, is that she's self-effacing. She doesn't see herself for what I know she is, you know, which, which is really a, a blessing to me, too, because that's called humility. And I can trust somebody like that. And a strong woman. She's got strength, yes. you know, for the right things. You know, John, I, I was thinking about some of the ladies um, where their husband aren't involved in ministry or, you know, they may go to church or, or uh, uh, with the women, but the women want them more involved in ministry. You can't just push your husband into That's ministry. That's a good point. And, and uh, I think a lot of women... Um, try that with their husbands, you know, nag them, you know, they nag them. I, I, I remember a woman who nagged her husband to death. He never could get anything right, nothing. My nothing. mom? <laughs> no, was it your mama? <laughs> you know, he, he could <laughs> never get anything right. And she was a su super, she was a spiritual person in the relationship. Mm. And it took years. The man finally came around and is walking with the Lord, but it took years. Many years. But you, you know, but her years were a lot of years of nagging. And then finally, she allowed the Spirit of God to touch mm -hmm. him and let that go. Mm -hmm. But so many years had gone by with her nagging and 
Negative. We're talking about 25 plus years. Yeah. Really? I mean, yeah, I it's not just a year or two or three. I think you even left her at oh, one 25, point. at least 25 yeah. years it, of it was, nagging. Talk about wear and tear. Oh, yeah. That's hard. Yeah. yeah you know, also, I uh, to what you're saying too, Marie, uh, I like that because on the flip side of it, when we look at uh, us as husbands, Pastor, when we're able to see our wives as a conduit for the Holy Spirit to speak through, it's almost of having this amazing uh, component of our marriage where, where we hear from the Lord. I, I think of Ab Abigail and David. When David wanted to go wipe out, I think his name was Nabal. He wanted to go wipe him out. And, uh, and Abigail stopped David and spoke to him and saying, don't regard this foolish man, I'm paraphrasing. Look what you have to, the, the, the influence and the advice that she was giving. And I think about how our wives are also, the Holy Spirit speaks through them. Absolutely. And it's an amazing tool to have that I think sometimes husbands overlook. Absolutely, you're right. Because I'm the one called, I'm the one, and they don't, yeah, and they don't hear from their wives. And so this is refreshing to hear. Well, you know, Jesus, God said the two shall become one flesh. You know, it's not good that the man should be alone. You know, he's an incomplete person. Where in the, where in the world did he get the idea that he didn't need her? You know, where did he get that idea? I mean, God said, I'm bringing you this woman to complete you, mm. and now you're disregarding the things that I brought her to help you to see? It doesn't make sense to me. And when you begin to value your wife in that capacity, when you realize that there are components she has that you don't have, and it makes you a better person, a whole person, you're very unwise if you don't listen to your wife. Now, ultimately, I have to take the responsibility for the decisions that are made. I stand before the Lord at, in that capacity. But my wife, you know, she has to be aware of that, that the way that, that Eve, again, Eve influenced Adam for the wrong. You know, well, wives need to remember they have the capacity to do that, too. And and I, I can be influenced by desiring to be with her more than anything else to the degree that I may not hear what the Spirit is saying I need to do. So that's why prayer and the Word and fellowship and all of that, that's why that's all so very important. Because if you don't have those things, you're left to your own devices. You're going to do the things that you feel good about right now. And you're not going to realize that had we been in the Word, had we been seeking God, had we asked for some advice, because some of these decisions are critical, um, we wouldn't have made some bad decisions. And over the years, um, I'm, I'm a, you know, you're going to know this. You've been on staff for a while now. I'm not one of these, these, these pastors that make snap decisions. I don't just go, yeah, we're going to do that because the Spirit says. I'm not that guy. I'm the one who, who has to think it through and weigh it through and wait, and sometimes for a long time until I have a sense this is the right thing. And a lot of times what happens is the Spirit just begins unfolding things very slowly, and they're naturally forming and shaping because he had said to me, stay out of it. And I didn't realize that. In my hesitance, I'm actually waiting on him while he's doing what he needs to do. God forms Adam with the, out of the dust, but he's there, a lifeless thing, until he breathes into it life and there are things he was forming before the life was seen and i think that sometimes god will do works in us like that the mm -hmm. forming process we're not sure what's we don't know what's going on until he breathes his life into it but then you see it all oh, it became a living whatever you know and so there are times that i have to wait on the lord while he's forming but he can use my wife as the breath that mm -hmm. animates those things and i'll say that's what it is, and that's what God wanted. And oh, now I see how this all ties together. And you know, like Jesus once said, he said, the things that I'm doing right now you don't understand, but you will later. That's where patience and waiting on the Lord really shows itself for what it is. And in marriage, God may have put on some man's heart uh, a call into ministry, but until God puts that call in the heart of the wife, the man's going to have a lot of problems until she really sees it. And what he has to do is he has to prove to her through his own personal ministry to her that he's a called man. If you can teach your wife, you can teach anybody. That's the truth. If I can teach my wife, I can sit down with this, this woman and I can say, thus saith the Lord. And isn't that what Paul says in Ephesians 5 when he says we wash him with the water of the word? 
I have to have a prophetic mantle in my woman's wife, uh, life. She needs to see me in a prophetic way. And Marie does. I mean, she, you know, she does. She'll say, God was speaking. God, God moved. She says things like that to me, you know. And, uh, and that's what I want. I, I, I want her to see me as more than the breadwinner. Any man can be a breadwinner. I want her to see me as uh, a man of God, a man who hears from God, because mm -hmm. she can trust that kind of man. Mm -hmm. And we are to be encouragers to our husbands, not pull them down. I mean, you know, we, there's plenty of women that uh, all they do is complain about their husbands. They never do enough for the, for the, for the women. I've heard many, many complaints over the years. That, and I've had to tell these women, you need to go to prayer and you need to be, you never mind about your husband. Take care of yourself regarding your walk with the Lord and how you speak to him. And uh, you change your attitude and you ask God to bless your husband. And what can you do for him? How can you minister to him? Because he may not be getting the attention that that uh, um, that he should from you, and uh, so That's we have true. to be mindful of one another and loving of one another and take care of each other and and uh, encourage one another. Everybody, every man needs encouragement by through their husband. I mean, by through their husband. Excuse well, me. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, by their mind. wife. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, my goodness. <laughs> well. Yeah. Bill needs to be encouraged. <laughs> and that speaks of the completeness of one to the other. They and make each other whole. Absolutely. And so. Yeah. If you if you get to know your wife and what 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 is pleasing to her and it, it ultimately pleases you too. You know, a man is a fool who, who doesn't understand that. You know, when my wife is happy, and it's not that the, the, the house revolves around her happiness, that happy, happy wife, happy life, you know, that's a joke. <laughs> you know, but when you've, got, when you've got a wife who knows she's loved and a husband knows he's respected, because I need to be respected much more than be told I, I love you. I need to, I need to know that that this woman, my my wife, that she respects me, and and that's why Paul used that word. He said that uh, the husband is to love the wife, but he says, "And wives respect your husband." Why do you say that? Because in our vocabulary, that's how we spell the word love. It's her respect, and so I need to be worthy of her respect. You know, because I can almost hear people right now. Well, he has to be worthy. You know, that's always, uh, that's true. You know, I should be a man who is worthy of respect. But God doesn't command the wife to wait until he's worthy. That's right. God commands her to respect him. And so if she wants to use and make excuses until he, that makes her God in his life, and that's part of your problem, is you're trying to make him into the image of the man you want him to be, rather than stepping out of the way in prayer, like my wife's been saying, and, you know, being honest, et cetera, I know it sounds simplistic, mm -hmm. but get out of the way and pray for him. You don't be believe in prayer? I do. Pray for him. God, touch my husband's yes. life. Or, Father, touch my wife. I've done all that I know to do. I don't know what else to do. I sense such a burden. I want to serve you. She doesn't want to set me free. God, help me. You know, you take it to the Lord. And there are things that, that happened. I had a woman approach me uh, years ago now after we had a, re a men's retreat. And she approached me and she said to me, Pastor, I need prayer. And I said, oh, for what? She said, my husband wants to serve the Lord more. And me, I've been, I've been quenching the spirit in his life. She says, I want him home more. I want him with me more. And, and I said, you know, have you ever prayed for a, a godly husband? Yeah, well, maybe this is the answer to prayer. You need to be aware of that. Because Marie and I, we've been around for a while now. We've seen men who started out well. Mm -hmm. 
who wanted to be used by the Lord, who had a wife who said, no, you stay home. No, I, you're neglecting us, or I need to go out and have my girl time or whatever. And um, some of those marriages didn't make it. Some of them didn't make it. And there are a lot of reasons why, but that was part of it. He wanted to pursue the Lord, and she didn't want to. Not to the degree he did. It's okay to go to church every other week. We ought to go off, you know, the kids are in soccer or they're playing baseball or they're doing this or that. And and I've seen that over the years, John. I've seen it where the husband and the wife's priorities are not Christ-centered. So other things take the place of that. And so they don't pray for each other. They don't read. They don't serve. They don't do any of that. And then they come up and they tell us, you know, oh, we're getting a divorce. And uh, a lot of that is just simply because they didn't do the basics. You know, they didn't. There's no conditions. When Paul was telling the husbands to love their wives as Christ has loved the church and for wives to respect their husbands, there's no conditions on the love nor on the respect. Word respect and love, regardless. Well, think about it. I mean, Christ loved the church. Think about it. I mean, was it a perfect, lovely, wonderful, sweet, no, we're a bunch of jerks. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're all sinners, and yet he loves us. Mm -hmm. You know, we ought to, how did Christ love the church? Well, think about first, the church isn't some beautiful, radiant thing. We're, we're, we're being purified by the blood of Christ and sanctified by his spirit uh, and his word, uh, but he loved us. And so he has plans for us, and he's going to make us into that beautiful, radiant bride through his spirit and word and all of that. But if you loved me and knowing that when I was first saved that I had a journey that was going to be very dry, could be trying to him, if you will, uh, yet he loved me, who am I to say my wife is not perfect, therefore? Mm. Once you become perfect, then I'll love her. No, that's not how Christ loved the church. You know, God, That's so true. We put conditions on it, you I know, and it. I love yeah. That. So yeah, that's good. Of, he loves us in spite of ourselves. Yes, because if if <laughs> I should be cast out a long time ago, if you know, if you put conditions on how he loved me, then why should I not love my wife the same way? Exactly. Right. So very convicting. Yes, and sobering. <laughs> it's sober, and so it's we're to love our wives, and wives were to love the husbands, and so. Well, you guys, it looks like that's our time for... That went quick, huh? That went quick. Went, real quick. <laughs> went really quick. That was a, a good time. Anything you'd like to say to our church as we close? Well, can't wait to see you on... Uh, let's see, what today? What is today? Friday. 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 Okay, so Sunday's coming. So looking forward to seeing you on Sunday. We love you and looking to see your beautiful faces. And yeah, I'm looking forward to Sunday. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, continuing our study, picking up and, and continuing our study in, in 2 Corinthians. It's going to be, I think it's a good study. Uh, I was edified as I was preparing it so prayerfully. Our church will be. Um, we had a good turnout this last uh, Sunday, that our very first Sunday that we got together. Um, the numbers of people who showed up surprised me, to be honest with you. I was expecting something entirely different. And so it was It was good to see so many people and uh, the joy that many had, especially my first service people. You second service people, they're kind of bummers, but the first service people <laughs> are a lot of fun. And uh, But uh, our Wednesday night, we returned to our Wednesday night last night and uh, or on Wednesday night and um, it was a blessing to once again to be able to gather. Worship has been so edifying, John. It has been. And, and with the release of our new uh, it is, he, he is Worthy yes. um, CD, I mean, it's sold out and we've had to order more. And uh, somebody was writing how they listened to the CD three times in one day already. They were so blessed by yes. it. Um, I think the church... Uh, Ought to be uh, purchasing that CD. Yes, yes. You know, it's a it's a great worship tool. God's it really God. is, and we're going to be making it available in various ways. And in, in you know, you can always call the office guys, and uh, we can order it for you. We can have it prepared for you. But uh, yeah, I love you. Uh, I'm I'm 
I'm so happy that I'm able to see you again. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. And you guys do have to come out. Pastor, you gave me a little sneak preview of your message for Sunday. And you're going to want to come out. And, and as Patrick, Pastor David mentioned, uh, go by the bookstore. You're able to pick up the CD after the services. It's a great CD. And so I would encourage our church family to pick that up. And so we love you, church family, and we look forward to seeing you. God bless you.